All right. So today, uh, today's class, we are going to be talking about, you know, continuing module three. Uh, and today we are going to be talking about um, uh, drift currents. So last time we talked about uh, carrier concentrations, Fermi-Dirac distribution and density of states, intrinsic and extrinsic carriers. So now we know how to calculate uh, the, the, the concentration of electrons and holes in a semiconductor. So our overall goal is to figure out the flow of electricity in a material. Electricity is moving charge. So moving electrons, moving holes. So we kind of answered the first question last time. We talked about how many electrons do we have? Do we have very few? Do we have many? And then how, how many holes do we have? Both types of charge carriers can conduct electricity. So now we go on to the next question is now that we know how many we have, now we can talk about how they move. How quickly do they move in the presence of a voltage applied to the material? Okay. Now, what I, the context you can kind of think about this is that let's say you have a resistor, you know, the most basic electrical element. You apply a voltage to that resistor and you get a current. We're going to understand where that whole idea of drift current comes from uh, in a semiconductor. So we'll be talking about concepts of scattering, mobility, conductivity, resistance, velocity saturation, and then eventually we'll get to um, how is a semiconductor resistor made. Okay, and I plan to finish this up uh, today. If we have a little bit of time, we'll get into the electron energy versus momentum diagrams. Um, if not, we may just uh, skip over this last section, this term, uh, because uh, we have a lot of other material to cover. We'll, we might come back to that later. All right, so let's... Um, let's go ahead and um, start with this. So thus far, we've looked at simplified energy band diagrams of n-type and p-type and intrinsic semiconductors. We figured out how to calculate carrier concentrations. All right, so at this point, you should be able to draw an energy band diagram if I give you the doping. And then if I give you the, uh, the energy band diagram, you should be able to tell me the doping. Oh, I'm sorry, I said that twice. If I give you the energy band diagram, you should be able to figure out doping. If I give you the doping, you should be able to draw the energy band diagram. Okay. Um, and, and the doping, of course, relates to the carrier concentration. NP equals NI squared will allow you to calculate the whole and electron concentration. Uh, we've talked about how carrier concentrations varies with temperature and doping. So we're, we're now going to talk about the behavior of carriers, how these holes and electrons move in the presence of electromagnetic fields. Right, so if we look at what is electrical current, I want to start off with a very basic concept, Ohm's law. Okay, in your introductory electronics course, you talked about V equals IR. Voltage equals current times resistance. And you've even done experiments in this. You apply a voltage, you measure a current with an ammeter. Now we're going to talk about, you know, what does this look like in a semiconductor? Like in how do we actually find the resistance of a semiconductor? If we put a voltage over a block of semiconductor material, let's say we just had a block of semiconductor material like this, I want to show you how to actually calculate the resistance of that semiconductor material today, today's class. Okay. Ohm's law, by the way, it describes something called drift current. There's another type of current called diffusion current, and that will be covered in the next module. So the things we want to uh, answer is like, first of all, what is drift current from a very physical model? How does drift current flow through a semiconductor and what determines the resistance of a semiconductor resistor? So it's the most basic element. So the first element we talked about is semiconductor resistor. The second element is the semiconductor diode. And then the third element is the, uh, the MOSFET. Okay, let me just check the chat window here. Okay, thank you, Ali. All right, so here I'm going to give you sort of a pictorial summary. Um, uh, let, let me just remind everyone what this is. A voltage source, um, you know, you can you imagine a laboratory voltage source or something like a nine volt battery. Okay, a voltage source has a positive terminal and a negative terminal, and that's connected to the resistor like this. Um, so this end of the resistor has a positive voltage compared to the other side. 
Okay, so this is right side is positive potential, left side is um, what we consider ground. You know, we'll often say that this is ground. And the electric field points from high potential to low potential. So there's an electric field within this um, material here, and the electric field points from positive to negative. Um, as a result of that electric field, the, as a result of the charge carriers within this resistive material, you end up getting a current flow going from positive to negative. And uh, the amounts, of course, are given by V equals IR. So if we look closely, let's look inside, zoom in and see what is going on in a semiconductor material that would give you this resistor-like properties. Okay, again, we start off with the voltage source, we have the positive potential here, negative potential here. And then we just have a block of semiconductor material. Okay, a rectangular block. Okay, so the first concept we're gonna just throw in here uh, is the dimension. So imagine that the semiconductor block has a length L and it also has um, you know, a height H and a width um, W, okay? And so it has a cross-sectional area on this side as well, which we'll get to in a second. That, that turns out to be very important, okay? The cross-sectional area is W times uh, the height, okay? But this is the length. The length is generally in the direction, is parallel to the direction of current flow. Okay, so the first uh, physical relationship I want you to remember from physics is that the applied voltage generates an electric field. And the electric field, the magnitude of that electric field is a voltage divided by the length. Okay, this is a, a relationship that we derive in an electromagnetics class. Um, we're not going to do that in this class. What I just want you to think about here is that electric field, the units for electric field is volts per centimeter. So volts, you know, Volts, of course, re reflects and me means a voltage, and the length is given in centimeters. Okay, so this voltage, if you apply it over a long length, you're going to get a small electric field, but if your length is very short, you could get a very strong electric field. So, it's just something to keep in mind here. Okay, electric field is vol voltage divided by the length. The electric field, the direction of the electric field, remember, this is a vector quantity. Um, the reason you know it's a vector quantity is because it's in bold. It's either in bold or it'll have an arrow written on top of it like this. Sometimes it'll, sometimes you can have both, but these indicate vector quantities. Uh, so it has a direction. As I mentioned before, the direction of the electric field points from the positive potential side to the negative potential side. Uh, this should not be bolded here, by the way. This voltage is, is, a, is a scalar quantity. It does not have direction. Voltage does not have direction. Electric field does. Okay, next concept. A conductive material contains charge density Q. You can't have electricity unless you have charge carriers. Okay, so you have to have some non-zero charge density. Okay, let me just go back to that. Okay, so I'm drawing out the charge density here now. So we have these electrons. So right now, just to keep things simple, we're not gonna look at holes right now, we're just looking at electrons. Okay, so imagine we have an N-type semiconductor where we only have electrons. So what we're interested in is what is the charge density? So the units for charge density is coulombs per centimeter cubed. If I took out one cubic center of material, how many electrons would I have in there? There's no formula for that that we're introducing yet. I just want you to understand charge density Q. All right, the electron, the electric field, uh, uh, in fact, let me just mention, <laughs> Let me mention that the charge density is what we've already calculated before. You know, we, we talked about the formulas to calculate the uh, concentration of electrons and holes um, in last class. Okay. All right. Now, next concept is that the electric field is going to propel these electrons in a direction opposite the electric field. So electric field is moving from right to left. So the electrons, of course, are going to travel with the velocity 
left to right. For holes, this is going to be the opposite. I just want, to, want everyone to know. Holes travel in the same direction as the electric field. Electrons travel opposite the electric field. So when you apply an electric field, just picture in your mind that these electrons are moving through the material with an average velocity v. And that average velocity is equal to the mobility times the electric field. Okay. The electric field part is straightforward. You can see that it's proportional to the electric field. The more electric field you apply, the more, the faster the electrons are going to move. Okay, it's kind of like water in a pipe. The more pressure you apply on, on the water pipe, the faster the water moves through the pipe. So it's very similar with um, voltage electric field. The, the larger voltage you apply, you get more electric field and that the electrons move through faster. So what is this constant mu? This is called mobility. And mobility is a material property. Okay, materials that are very good conductors have high mobility because that means that the electrons move fast through the material. In highly conductive materials, the electrons just boom, they move very fast through the material. And in, high, in poor conductive materials, the, the electrons move slowly through the material. So the mobility is an important uh, um, parameter, more important material property. Okay, next. Once we know the electric field, we can calculate the velocity of the uh, electrons. And um, then we can calculate something called current density. Excuse me. Uh, the current density is equal to the charge density. The charge density means how many electrons we have per centimeter cubed. So the units for that is given here, coulombs per centimeter cubed. So charge density times the speed at which they're moving, the velocity. And this has units, centimeters per second. So if you combine these together, you'll get um, a quantity called current density, which has units amps per centimeter squared. OK, one amp, by the way, just to remind everyone, one amp is equal to one coulomb per second. So amps per centimeter squared is the same thing as coulombs per second per centimeter squared. All right, and so this, uh, um, this velocity that we calculated earlier is equal to mobility times the electric field. So the velocity, just plug in the formula for that, mobility times the electric field. So the current density is equal to the charge density multiplied by the mobility multiplied by the electric field. Now, uh, what you can kind of think about here is, you know, when you're calculating the actual current, now the current is something we can actually measure. And the simple formula for current is just, the current is just the current density times the cross-sectional area. It's, a, it's the total number of electrons pass, uh, total, I should say total amount of charge, not the total amount of electrons. So the total, total, charge passing through the cross-sectional area per second. So imagine drawing a cross-sectional area like this, OK? The current is, like, imagine these electrons just passing through this um, you know, cross-sectional area. So when, when, I like, when I think about current, I like to think about counting up how much charge is passing through that plane. That is, that is the current. Okay, and that's equal to the, the, the current density, which has units amps per centimeter squared. And if you multiply current density by the area, by the cross-sectional area, basically the area of this plane here, that will give you the current. And that is something we can physically measure with an ammeter. All right, so just uh, um, putting all these things all, all these quantities here for your reference. Uh, we talked through all these uh, uh, quantities. Any questions on drift current on this slide? 
All right, good. All right, I mean, everyone's following. Please, uh, please don't be shy if you have questions. All right, so uh, some discussion questions. Let's say we put a one volt voltage across the material. Okay, so in this, in this image, this is one volt. So we start off with one volt, but then what we do is we double the voltage to two volts. So which of the following occurs? So there's one, two, three, four, five different choices. And um, <laughs> just gonna put everybody on the spot here because we have five folks in the lecture today. So how about Clayton, you, you take number one, you take A, Melvin, you're on B, uh, Janan, you're on C, Corey, D, and Ali, E. So I want you to look at just uh, start with the one that I assigned to you and just determine if it's true or false and um, you know come up with a justification for your answer. So um, I'll give you, give you a second to think about it. Um, see the equations. Oh yeah. Um, so how about this? Just take um, take a take a little bit of time. Just write down the question on a on a paper, and then I'll move back to the other slide. So we have one voltage across the material, and we double the voltage to two volts. Which of the following occurs? Okay, so I'll go ahead and move back. You can look at the summary slide. Okay, Clayton, how about we start with you? Um, I believe that it's true, the which was, I think it said the velocity doubles um, if the voltage doubles because yep. the voltage and the electric field are proportional and the electric field and the velocity are proportional. That's right. That's right. If we double the voltage, we double the electric field. And if you double the electric field, as you can see down here, the voltage will double as well. Good. All right, next one, Melvin. So I think I got the one. Um, it's a, the velocity of the electron doubles and it changes direction. Um, I think it's yeah. false because um, while the velocity does, the velocity of the electron does double, it doesn't, the direction of the electron doesn't change. Correct. Yeah, there's no, re there's no reason for the electron velocity to, uh, I'm sorry, the velocity changes, but the direction does not. Yes. Only the magnitude changes. So electrons always go opposite the electric field. Now, if I said that there's holes in there, if we switched it from electrons to holes, then the holes would be moving in the other direction. They, they would be moving in the same direction as the electric field. OK, good. Next next up, uh, part C, Janan. Um, it's false, because if you're hiring the voltage, your electric field is going up, so which is directly yep. related to the velocity. Good. Um, all right, uh, Corey, I guess yep. there's only one right answer. So. Yeah, so. I realize uh, that. 
D would be false as well. And it's kind of a combination of, I think, uh, Melvin and Janan's answer. Um, since the electric field uh, isn't, I guess, changing, um, the direction of the electron flow wouldn't change. And since the uh, voltage is doubling, um, the electric field would also double along with the uh, velocity. Right, right. Yeah, so um, the electric field changes, the, only the, the magnitude changes, the direction does not change. Right. Good, good. Um, so good. And uh, Ali, the um, electric field gets cut by 50%. Um, I think it's false, assuming that we have the same length. So when we increase the voltage, the electric field also increases. Yeah, exactly. So the electric field would actually increase by how much? By, um, it will double. It'll double. Correct. Correct. Um, let, let, let me ask, so what would happen, you know, if we doubled the, uh, um, doubled the voltage, what would happen to the current? Should also double. The current would also double. Right. Right. Okay. Good. Um, what else can I say here? Yeah, I think we'll just we'll just leave it at that. You know, there's you could imagine there's all sorts of conceptual questions we can have here. All right, but let's let's move on. Uh, so now let's do another example here. Uh, this one you're going to be doing a quick calculation. Suppose we put a voltage three volts across a two centimeter long p-type semiconductor material with mobility 500 centimeters squared per volt second, and a hole concentration 10 to the 17th per centimeter cube. What is the velocity of the holes? So now, you know, the reason I have this one up here is because I, it's the same type of problem, except now we have holes instead of electrons. And we still have our cross-sectional area here. So I just want you to calculate the velocity of the holes and the direction, magnitude and direction in centimeters per second. So you'll actually be doing a quick calculation here. So everyone can go ahead and try that on their own. All right, how about we start with the electric field? Do we have an answer for the electric field? Isn't it just uh, voltage over length? Yep. So it's voltage divided by the length. So three divided by two, three volts over two centimeters. So 1.5 volts per centimeter. And then part B is where we figure out the electric field. Um, the velocity. So the velocity is equal to the mobility times the electric field. Mobility is 500 centimeter squared per volt second. And then the electric field we found out is 1.5 volts per centimeter. Okay, just so you can see the units here, the volts will cancel uh, centimeters. So this one of the centimeters will cancel up there, and you're left with um, you're left with centimeters per second. So it'll be, this will be 750 centimeters per second. All right, let me ask another question here. How would how would the velocity change if we doubled the cross sectional area? How would this answer change if we doubled the cross-sectional area? 
So we made it fatter. Would it become half? Mm, not quite. I think it would stay the same. It would actually stay the same. Yeah. Interest, interestingly. <laughs> Now, I don't know, we, a lot of times we think about um, in resistors, we think, of, well, if we change the dimensions then everything's gonna change, right? Well, it's only some aspects of it change. The, the resistance of the material would in fact change, okay? But um, the electric field only depends on the length. And then as we saw, as we solved here, the velocity only depends on um, the electric field and the mobility. So interestingly, the, the, the electrons, and so the holes and electrons, what have you, would move at the same velocity. But it, the resistance would actually change. The current would actually change because you have a different cross-sectional area. Okay, if you don't believe it, you can do the, do the math with that and uh, you'll, you'll find out. Okay, so now that we've figured out um, the relationship between voltage and current that we showed on this slide here, we have a relationship between voltage and current. You know, we, we applied a voltage here. We applied a voltage and then we have an equation for the current. So now if we want to find the resistance of the material, resistance is defined as voltage over current. So that's what we're doing here. Okay, so just recapping the key things from the last slide. Um, the electric field is V over L. Current density is Q times V. Q times velocity, which is Q mu times E. And then the current is equal to the uh, current density times the area. So it's the current is equal to Q, charge density times the mobility, times the electric field, times the cross-sectional area. All right. And the vo um, so if we just do this ratio, resistance is defined as, by Ohm's law, it's defined as the ratio of voltage over current. So the voltage is E times L, right, by this relationship up here. And the current we just solved for, Q mu times E times A. And the key, uh, one of the key parts about this when you do problems like this in electromagnetics is that you end up having the electric field in both the numerator and the denominator. So when those cancel out, you're left with a term you're left with an equation that's only dependent on the geometry, the length and the area. You see these are the geometric terms. And then the material properties, Q and mu, which have to do with the carrier concentration and mobility of the semiconductor. Okay, so in order to separate the geometric terms from the material properties, we basically take Q and mu and we basically encapsulate that into, um, into one constant called the conductivity sigma. So sigma is defined as Q times mu. And um, it's just, remember Q is the density of charge carriers. So it's your hole or electron concentration. And then mu is the mobility, okay? So this would be the resistance this is the resistance uh, general equation for the resistance of a uh, material. This mobility, dip, uh, this, I'm sorry, not mobility, the conductivity is a material property, okay? So now we're gonna figure out, well, um, how do we determine the conductivity of a semiconductor? That's the next question. The very simple equation that we have here, Q times mu, charge density times mobility, well, that would be fine. This would work fine if we just had one type of carrier. But in semiconductors, we actually have electrons and holes. So we have to consider both. And so that goes on to our, um, that will, uh, when we start talking about um, conductivity, we'll, we'll uh, get to that. Let me, let me just jump to that slide for a second here. that slide disappear. Oh. Did we talk about um, 
conductivity of a material? This is strange. I wonder if this slide got, oh no, it's here, it's here. Yeah, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that in a second, okay. Actually, I take that back. Let's just, let's do it right now. All right, <laughs> sorry for that little detour. Okay, so uh, in a semiconductor, we have to consider both electrons and holes. So uh, the conductivity, this, this factor sigma that we're talking about here is going to depend on the concentration of carriers um, and the mobility of the carriers. So it's Q times mu, just like we said on that last slide. All right, so this is the basic formula. Now for a semiconductor, we have to consider that we have two types of charge carriers. All right, this is a, Q is a charge density, mu is a mobility, and then uh, sigma is the conductivity. Units for conductivity, by the way, is ohms per centimeters, and this is, has a negative one sign here. So it's one over ohm centimeters. Okay, so in a semiconductor, there's two types of charge carriers, electrons and holes. So this equation, this simpler equation becomes, uh, it has to have two parts. So the effective conductivity of a semiconductor is equal to the conductivity due to electrons plus the conductivity due to holes. Okay. The reason this works, by the way, the reason we could just add them up is because um, all the equations that we've talked about in, in the previous slides, they're all linear equations. So when you have a, a linear system, you can uh, um, actually like, you know, the, the principle of linear superposition allows us to simplify the equation, uh, basically allows us to um, add up the conductivities like this. There's some details I'm leaving out here, but just, um, you know, trust me on that, it can be derived fairly simply. So um, the conductivity is equal to the, the conductivity due to electrons, conductivity due to holes. And so each one prescribes to this formula here. Okay, so the conductivity due to electrons is the mobility of electrons times the uh, con uh, times Q times the concentration of electrons. Remember Q here is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. So that's the amount of charge that's in one electron. Okay. Uh, same thing for the holes. So there's the hole mobility here times Q times P. Now, one of the things you notice here, okay, N and P should be straightforward. You know, we talked about that before, electron concentration and hole concentration. Something that might seem foreign to you right now is why do we have a mu N and mu P? It turns out that electrons and holes actually have different mobilities. They move at different speeds through the semiconductor, so they have a different mobility. Most of the time, electrons move faster than holes due, the, due to the nature of what a hole is and what an electron is, all right? So we'll talk more about this later, but I just want you to know that it's, it's there. They're different, they, they'll, they'll be different depending on electrons or holes. So both of these terms have a Q in them. So the Q can come out here. Now, so this is a semiconductor mobility. Now, most of the time, one of these components will be larger than the other, most of the time. Okay, so let's say we have an n-type semiconductor. In an n-type semiconductor, the electron concentration is many orders of magnitude larger than the hole concentration. In other words, n is much, much larger than p. So when that's the case, this second term is just going to become insignificant compared to the first term. And so then the conductivity would become approximately equal to just this first term here times Q. Vice versa with the P-type semiconductor where P is much greater than N, okay? 
these types of shortcuts will you know, make calculations a lot easier. Approximations, engineers love approximations when they're done the right way. So this term is dominant in an n-type semiconductor. This term is dominant in a p-type semiconductor. Okay, so at this point, you should be able to calculate the resistance of a semiconductor material. If I give you the geometric dimensions, I give you the length, the width, and the height, and then I also tell you what the hole and electron concentration and mobilities are, you should be able to figure out the sigma, and then you should ultimately be able to find the resistance. And then if I asked you, well, if I took a semiconductor block of material and I put a certain voltage across it, what kind of current would I get? You can answer that too. Okay, so these are very practical type questions. All right, let's back out for a second here and um, uh, we could do this quick example. I think in the interest of time, we'll just, um, I'll walk you through this example real quick. Suppose the conductivity of a semiconductor material is two ohms per centimeter. What is the resistance of a bar of this material? Length is, point one, uh, length is one centimeter cross-sectional area is 0.1 by 0.1 centimeters. So just if we draw this block here, like so, you know, this would look something like this. The length of the semiconductor block is one centimeter. And then um, this dimension here is 0.1. This dimension here is 0.1. Okay, and we're applying a voltage through the, through the length of the material. So the resistance is just equal to uh, L divided by sigma A. So this is L divided by sigma times the width times the height. All right, the conductivity is two. The width is, um, I'm just leaving out the units here. Okay, so 0 0.1 times 0 0.1 is, time, is 0 0.01. 0 0.01, one divided by 0 0.01 is uh, 100. 100 divided by two is 50. So this is 50, 50 ohms is the resistance of this bar of material. Okay, discussion question. If we double the cross-sectional area of a material, what happens to the resistance? So we talked about what would happen to the electric field so now, what would happen to the resistance? Would it get reduced by 50%? It would go down by 50%, right. Because the cross-sectional area is in the denominator. Right? So if we double the cross-sectional area of the material, the resistance goes down. All right, let's start talking about mobility now. So at this point, we've determined that this equation, right? The velocity is equal to the mobility times the electric field. But what is this mobility and how, what determines mobility? What does it depend on? So uh, to answer this question, we have to understand a, a physical mechanism called scattering. So if you just imagine an electron flying through space. Okay, an electron traveling through free space. It's just gonna go. It's not gonna bump into anything, so it's gonna achieve maximal velocity. All right, and the velocity that it attains depends on how much voltage potential you put on there. Okay, but the main point I want you to think about is that the electron moves through a vacuum easily because it doesn't bump into anything. But in a solid material, as the electron's moving through the material, it's actually bumping into things. And that bumping into things is called scattering. In a solid material, electrons collide with lattice vibrations or lattice impurities. There's two different types of scattering mechanisms, which I'll talk about in the, in the next couple of slides. But what does scattering do? It slows down the velocity of the electron because the electron keeps on bumping into things. And so this effect of scattering is represented by the mobility. 
So if you have a lot of scattering, you're going to have a small mobility. If you have less scattering, you'll have a higher mobility. So when carriers are actually moving around, so let's say, <clears throat> um, let's say I don't apply an electric field at all. So we have an electron that starts off in position one. Okay. If there's no electric field applied, then the electron's not really going anywhere. Okay. But just one little detail that you should know is that electrons, due to thermal vibrations, due to thermal vibrations, electrons are always kind of like randomly bouncing around. That's a random motion. Okay, some of you have heard the term like Brownian motion, which applies to like small particles. So unless you're at absolute zero, the electrons are just kind of bouncing around. But it, with no electric field applied, the, the bouncing around is completely random. So it might bounce from left to right, collide into something, move from right to left, collide again, move, move down, collide, move up, you know, like just like, it's like a ping pong ball, you know, just bouncing off in different directions. If you add an electric field, so let's say I add an electric field. So I have my electron that start off in this position here, position one, and I have an electric field now. So the, electro, uh, the electron is going to move in the direction of the electric field. Let's say it, it moves and then it bounces, it, it collides with, uh, with an atom at uh, point two, and it, the collision sends the electron off in this direction, okay? Kind of like a, like a ping pong ball, right? But now suppose, you know, we also have this electric field. So even though there's this collision, the, the, the electron is initially moving in this downwards direction, the electric field is gonna start accelerating it in this direction. Because remember, electrons ideally would like to go exactly opposite the electric field. Okay, so the collision caused the electron to move downwards, but the electric field is gonna cause the electron to move from left to right. So eventually the electron's path starts to go from left to right. And then it collides again, uh, sends it off in a different direction, but the electric field causes it to re return to a left to right kind of direction. Okay. Sometimes you can have collisions that are, um, you know, more intense where they can actually reverse the direction completely. But over time, over time, on average, the electron will experience a net average velocity going from left to right, opposite the electric field. Okay, so that's described by this simple equation. Rather than trying to account for every single collision, uh, we just encapsulate all of that information into just a simple constant mu. Okay, and by the way, if you're confused about this negative sign, it's you know the, the electrons move opposite the electric field, so that's why there's a negative sign here. All right, so now let's now that we understand where this, you know, where this mobility term is coming from, we can actually derive how to calculate it. So the mobility is a constant which describes the ease with which an electron or hole moves through the material. The higher the mobility, the faster an electron moves through the lattice. We talked about that already. The more frequently collisions occur, the slower the electron is going to move and therefore the lower the mobility. Less collisions means faster mobility. Just remember that. Uh, now, if we go into a little bit more of the details of it, we can think about the electron as a particle that has an effective mass. Now, I want you to think about, you know, you can think about the electron as like a billiard ball, okay? Like a, you're on a pool table and you, the electron is moving in a certain direction. It collides with something and has a, um, a collision that sends it off in a different direction, okay? So... The formula for mobility is given by QT divided by the uh, effective mass. Now, before getting into all the details of effective mass and everything, don't get confused by that yet. Just think about like what the intuition of this formula is telling you. What's on the num numerator and what's on the denominator? Mobility is how fast the electrons move through the material. So how is that related to um, these upper two things? So Q is the charge. Okay, so let's not think too much about let's not too, think too much about the charge right now. Mean time between collisions. 
Okay. If the collisions are happening very frequently, then the mean time is going to be small and you'll have a small mobility. On the other hand, if the electron is traveling for quite some time before it collides, then this is going to become large and the mobility will become large. So it turns out the mobility is proportional to the mean time between collisions. And then on the denominator here is the effective mass. So this one you have to think about a little bit more. If you have a, um, a ping pong ball, okay, that is being accelerated by um, accelerated in a certain direction. The, when the ping pong ball collides, it has, you know, because it has low mass, it has low momentum. So the ping pong ball can change directions very quickly. If you throw a ping pong ball against the wall, it changes, you know, it can very easily change direction. If you threw, um, if you threw a, a, a bowling ball at a wall, the bowling ball has a lot more mass, so it's not going to change direction as easily because it has more inertia. Okay, that is why the the effective mass is in the denominator. Things that are are smaller in mass, smaller in mass, will have a higher mobility. Okay, the way that I like to think about it is that light objects, light objects are more agile; they have less momentum, so they can change direction more quickly. You know, if, even if we compare, if I compare myself to an ant, an ant is super agile. Ants, if you've seen them, they can change directions instantaneously. But us humans, we have we have a lot more mass, so we have inertia, and so it takes us a while to change directions more quickly. All right, all right. So that's why the the effective mass is on the denominator. Now, if we look some more uh, more details at the mobility, we can actually think about a more specific uh, derivation of where the mobility is coming from. Okay, the first concept is what we've talked about already. These particles are constantly colliding into other, um, colliding with other, with atoms. So imagine that um, you have an electron here, you have a nucleus of silicon here, and think about this as just the electron is colliding with the atom. When it collides, it changes direction. So the first, um, the first thing we can think about here is that every time the uh, electron collides, it has a change in momentum. Each collision reduces the momentum by an amount that's proportional to the electron velocity. So the, the change in momentum, remember momentum is just equal to m times v, right? m times v. If the electron is traveling at a certain velocity and we basically kill that velocity, so if we just say, for example, the velocity goes to zero, then the change in momentum is equal to m times what the initial velocity was. All right, so the change in momentum is equal to the mass of the electrons times the velocity at which it's moving. Next step. Now, this is the part that you may or may not remember from physics, but um, there is this fundamental concept that force is the rate of change of momentum. Okay, so if you imagine collisions happening again and again and again, this electron keeps on colliding, there's going to be a rate of change of momentum. Every collision is changing the momentum. And uh, so when the collision is, when those collisions are happening frequently, then it's that, that results in a force, basically. The scattering force is the time averaged force exerted by the lattice on the electron. Okay, so let's look at the equation for this. The scattering force is equal to dp dt. The change in momentum with respect to time, okay? And if we apply something from calculus called the chain rule, we can break this up into two parts here. The change in momentum for every collision, dp dc. Now, the reason we did this is because this is every time there's a collision, there's a momentum change. And we just talked about that here, delta p equals mv. So every collision, there's a momentum change. And then we look at DC DT, which is the number of collisions per second. All right. So uh, DP DC is uh, mass times velocity, as we found. The collisions per second is just one over T, where T is the time between collisions, and that's given in seconds. Okay, so this means that we have a scattering force. 
the last part here is now we're going to consider the scattering force as a drag force that's slowing down a moving electron. It opposes the electric force moving it forward. And if we, we can set the two forces equal to each other to solve for the velocity. So you have your electron here. There's an electric force. Remember, there's, you know, we assume that there's an electric field going in this direction. So there's an electric force that's, that's trying to move the electron from left to right, but the scattering force is going in the opposite direction. That's slowing down the electron. And so this scattering force and electric force, we can set these equal to each other, okay? The analogy I'm gonna give you here is, well, you, you set them equal to each other and you solve for the velocity, okay? Let, the analogy I'm gonna give you here is uh, skydiving. Has anyone gone skydiving before? <laughs> so what happens when you jump out of a plane is initially your velocity is zero, okay? Gravity is accelerating you downwards. So that's the analogous to this, you know, there's a force that's pulling you towards the earth. As you go faster and faster, um, there's a drag force that builds up. The drag force is because you're, there's all these air molecules. You're, you're going faster and faster and faster. The faster you go, there's like a, a drag force because you're hitting the air. And um, so that, that's considered like a, a drag force. So there's a force of gravity on one end, and then there's a force, there's a drag force on the other end. When those forces are equal to each other, that's when you get what's called terminal velocity. So if you ever jump out of a plane, like what, what'll happen is that you'll feel an acceleration for the first 10 to 15 seconds or so, and then it'll feel like you're not accelerating at all, at all. So then it'll actually feel like you're floating in the air, which is kind of cool. Um, so similarly, this is what happens with an, with an electron. Let's say the electron, you apply an electric field, the electron starts to accelerate. As it's going faster and faster, it starts to experience more scattering force. You can see that the scattering force is velocity dependent. If the electron's not moving at all, there's no scattering force. The faster the electron moves, the more scattering force there is. Eventually, the scattering force and will become equal to the uh, electric force. And that is when the electron reaches terminal velocity. So we set scattering force equal to the electric force. NV over T is the scattering force. Q times E is the electric force. This is something that we covered in module two. And so uh, from here, we can solve for the terminal velocity. The velocity is equal to QT over M times the electric field. Well, guess what? This is the mobility term here. Remember before we said velocity is equal to mobility times the electric field. These three terms, QT over M is the mobility, okay? So this equation that you saw on the previous slide here, QT over M, that actually has a very straightforward derivation like this, okay? So now you know where mobility comes from. Intuition that you have in your head, lighter objects will have a faster mobility. Longer time between collisions will have less mobility. All right, let's, um, we have about 10 minutes left here and I wanna cover concepts of lattice scattering here. So in, in any solid material, uh, there's two mechanisms which cause uh, scattering. The first is lattice scattering. The second is impurity scattering. So these won't take too long to uh, explain. Uh, in any solid material, an atomic lattice vibrates at temperatures above zero Kelvin. Zero Kelvin is where all vibrations stop. Anything above zero Kelvin, you end up getting thermal vibrations. And what it looks like is, is like this. Okay, and just, you can think about the atoms kind of vibrating like this. Okay, these are the nuclei of the silicon atoms. These, this is the silicon lattice, every silicon atom bound to four, um, uh, four other silicon atoms around it. And the nuclei, think about them as having these sort of vibrations. Okay, so lattice scattering is when an electron collides with a vibrating lattice, and that causes it to change direction. And that, that change in direction I just showed you on the previous slide, you know, imagine that you have an electron here, it just bumps into, um, 
yeah, an atom and then it bounces off like this, okay? It turns out that the more vibrations you have in the lattice, the more vibration, more the atoms are vibrating, the more likely you are to have a collision. Okay, and the way you can, and the way I like to think about it is imagine like if there's, um, if there's a, uh, uh, at the goal, you have, you know, someone's trying to kick a soccer ball, you know, think about the soccer ball as an electron. And then there's, um, you know, in front of the soccer ball, you have a goalie and the goalie's just moving their hands around like this, you know, vibrating their hands like this. If the hands are moving around a lot, there's, there's a greater probability that the soccer ball will collide with the hand and the goalie will be able to, you know, prevent, prevent it from going into the net. Okay, so the more vibrations there are, the more likely there is for a collision to happen. There's a temperature dependence, so, so there's, of course, there's a temperature dependence because the higher temperatures you go, the more vibrations you have, and therefore the higher the probability of scattering there is. Okay, so um, basically the, uh, uh, the mobility goes down as a function of temperature. Scattering rate goes up, mobility goes down. So now we go on to the second scattering mechanism called impurity scattering. This is a little bit more complicated, but not terribly. So this is where carriers are deflected by ionized donors. In fact, it's called dopant ions due to Coulombic forces. Okay, so the way to think about this, uh, imagine that we have a doped semiconductor. So this is an N-type semiconductor. Um, and remember that the arsenic, um, the arsenic ion it's a column five element. It had an, had an extra electron. The electron is it, uh, moved somewhere else in the lattice and you're left with a positively charged nucleus. So this is a, um, a dopant ion. Now imagine that we have an electron here. Okay, and this has an effective positive charge. So as the electron is moving through the lattice, if there was no charge here, if there's no Coulombic interaction between the electron and this nucleus, the electron would just go um, in a straight line like this, like it, like it might normally do, unperturbed. But if it happens to go by a charged atom, then that charge will cause a Coulombic force. You can think about this as an attractive force. And that attractive force will actually cause the electron to sort of deflect off in this direction. Okay, so uh, you know th this type of this is because the um, at when the electron is near this atom, when it's near the atom, the Coulombic interaction is the strongest. So that when that interaction happens, it gets deflected off this way. So this obviously has a doping dependence. The more of these impurity uh, dopant ions there are. The more, um, the more this uh, scattering effect is going to happen. So higher doping will reduce mobility. And there's also a temperature dependence. Uh, the, this one's, you have to think about this a little bit more carefully. But think about this in terms of velocity. If the electron is moving slowly, if the electron is moving slowly, then there's going to be more time for the electron to interact with uh, this dopant ion, the more time it has to interact, the, the more deflected the electron will get from its original path. Okay, So at low temperatures, there's less thermal vibration, so the electrons naturally move slower. And so it spends more time near the dopant ion, more deflection, so lower mobility. So you get this interesting effect with where um, before, with lattice scattering, the scattering rate goes up as a, as a function of temperature, more scattering at high, high temperatures. And impurity scattering, you get more scattering at low temperatures. So you have these two different effects. Of, I'm, I'm going to skip over this question here. Um, and I'm just going to go, I'm going to go to this one here just so you can see this temperature dependence. So what ends up happening it's quite interesting is that um, when you go to really high temperatures, you get lattice scattering. And so the mobility drops because of lattice scattering at, at high temperatures. At really low temperatures, the mobility drops due to impurity scattering. Okay, this, by the way, this happens if you have a doped semiconductor. But there's a sweet spot in the middle. 
There's a sweet spot in the middle where you achieve a maximum mobility. <clears throat> and so th this is this is the region where we like to use our semiconductors. And different semiconductors will have a different optimal temperature of operation. Okay. We've we've talked about these questions already. Why is lattice lattice scattering more important at high temperatures? It's because um, there's more vibrations in the atom. Why is impurity scattering more important at low temperatures, uh, more deflection due to slower speeds? Okay, so I won't rehash that. So there's the temperature dependence of mobility. Um, so let's talk about the doping dependence of mobility. That's quite simply what we covered on the last slide. The more mobility and the more impurities you have, you have more impurity scattering. And so that will reduce the mobility. So if we look at these charts here, these charts are you're going to be using quite frequently. Excuse me. And so we have the um, mobility of electrons, mobility of holes uh, versus doping. So let's just look at one of them uh, so we don't get overwhelmed. X axis is the doping. Y axis is the mobility on a log scale. OK, so you can see that the mobility of electrons is going down. Once you get above 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17, the mobility really starts to drop. This is because of um, impurity scattering. Uh, then you have the mobility of holes also. Similarly, when you get to 10 to the 16, 10 to the 17, it starts to drop as well. Okay, This trend is true for all of these semiconductors here. Calium arsenide, germanium, silicon. Okay, so the first thing I want you to notice here is the fact that mobility starts to drop at higher dopings. The second thing, which you've already noticed, I'm sure, is that the mobility of holes typically is faster than the mobility of the electrons. Okay, and that brings us to the second question here. Why is the mobility of holes lower than electrons? And it turns out it's because the holes have a larger effective mass. Okay, you know how mobility is um, Q times time between collisions divided by the effective mass. Holes have a larger effective mass, so they end up having a lower mobility. Okay, the reason for that is remember when we went back to module uh, module two, we were talking about like what are electrons and what are holes. In order and how do they move? So the way you can picture an electron moving is the electron is just jumping from state to state. A hole, on the other hand, in order for a hole to move from left to right, the electron has to move from left right to left. And then for the hole to move again, a different electron has to move from right to left. So there's there's more involved in a hole moving than, than an electron moving. That's the way that I like to um, kind of think about it. So holes naturally have a larger effective mass, so that's why they end up having a lower mobility, sometimes two or three X more, and sometimes even a factor of 10 more. In the case of gallium arsenide, there's a huge difference about hole mobility and electron mobility. Uh, just keep in mind when you're reading these log plots, every hash mark on the Y axis, it goes two, four, six, eight, and then 10. So this would be uh, 10 to the two is 100, centimeter squared per volt second. So 100, 200, 400, 600, 800, and then 1,000 up here. Okay, just reading the log scale. All right. Uh, this is another slide that just shows the mobility, um, the mobility versus temperature um, and doping in silicon. This is showing the electron mobility, hole mobility. This is something that you can just use as a reference. And what you can see basically at, at um, you know, at temperatures, you, you can see the mobilities uh, dropping. Uh, this is due to lattice scattering, okay? Impurity scattering starts to drop mobility at really low temperatures, but we're not, we're not really looking at those temperatures in this graph. This graph is looking at room, te um, room temperatures here all the way up to 200 Celsius. So this is the region where lattice scattering is dominant. Uh, and you can kind of see what the, the mobilities uh, ver, uh, for uh, versus temperature for all these different doping concentrations. 
you can use this for your uh, for your homeworks and such. All right. And so there's just a couple a couple things I want to cover. Um, this is just so we can finish up this module. If anyone needs to go right now, uh, feel free. Um, the lecture is going to be recorded. I want to spend another like, you know, uh, maybe about 10 minutes or so just finishing up this uh, section on mobility and resistance. If you can stay, you know, that'll be wonderful. All right. So, uh, so if we look at the mobility of um, some popular semiconductor materials, uh, this is a chart of it. Again, you can use this as a reference. Uh, germanium, silicon, um, gallium arsenide, gallium phosphide, indium phosphide. So when we look at these materials, an electrical engineer, process engineer will look at these and say like, well, which, which materials should we use? We have to consider cost, we have to consider resistance. You know, if we're, if we're not considering cost at all, and um, we're looking at an n-type semiconductor. Which of these materials do you think would make the most conductive material? The ones with high mobility. Exactly, the ones with high mobility. If we consider that it's an n-type material, then we'd only be looking at the electron mobility, not the whole mobility, because the electron mobility is the one that um, you know, that determines the conductivity. Um, so yeah, you'd, you'd pick something that, that has a very fast electron mobility. Um, in the case of a P-type semiconductor, your choice of material might be different. You can see that indium phosphide, while it has a huge electron mobility, it has a really low hole mobility. So if you have a P-type semiconductor, maybe you wanna use germanium instead, which, which has a higher hole mobility. So high mobility materials have less resistance and some lower transit times. Transit times, it, it won't make all that much sense right now, but it's it's important when, it, when you're trying to build high speed switching circuits, which is important in wireless communications and of course in digital computation. So when we're looking at new materials, you know, like if we were talking about the your assignment today with, um, uh, you know, evaluating and comparing different technologies. You know now that electron mobility and band gap are two very important properties of a material. So as, as this is a nice review paper on the electronics based on 2D materials. They compare, they make a two-dimensional map of different materials and where they fall in terms of band gap and electron mobility. So for applications where you, um, you just want to have a conductive material, you don't want to have a band gap and you want to have high mobility. That's where, so you'd use something like graphene. On the other hand, if you want to have a, a material that has a controllable band gap, um, then you'd want to use something like molybdenum, molybdenum disulfide. And then there are these materials that are kind of in the middle here. Um, silicon falls here at the 1.12 electron volt band gap and relatively, you know, decent mobility. So these are, you know, important material parameters um, for semiconductors. So this slide shows um, what a semiconductor resistor actually looks like in practice. Um, so you've seen, you know, like I showed you the pictures of those wafers, you know, like this is the top view of a wafer and the side view of a wafer looks like this. So it's just a, a piece of silicon that's fairly thin usually about 0.5 millimeters is a typical thickness of a silicon wafer. And then on the surface, on the surface here is where all the interesting stuff is fabricated. Okay, so we're looking at the top view. This is the top view and this is the side view. So in the side view, you'll see that um, just the top surface of the semiconductor is where the resistor is made. So you might start off with a um, maybe a p-type substrate, and then you diffuse an n-type material into here. Okay. Now you might be wondering some details of why that works. I I won't get into all the details of it right now. You can have an insulating uh, medium in between there, um, so that will kind of isolate this from the rest of the rest of the uh, uh, wafer. 
So let's say you have an n-type semiconductor and then you have a metal contact here, another metal contact here. So this is kind of like, this is a one wire connected to your resistor. Here's another wire connected to your resistor. This is the length of your resistor. So you can see that in the top view. Top view shows the metal contact here, metal contact here. This is the length of your resistor. And this W is the width of your resistor. And then this is the height or the thickness of your resistor, okay? This X sub J is controlled by how long you put the, um, how long you put the, the, the silicon wafer in the diffusion furnace where you end up getting this N-type material formed here. And it turns out that the width and the length can actually be controlled through a CAD design. When you design a resistor, you will actually use a computer program to draw where you want your metal contacts and where you want that n-type semiconductor to go. So a designer will actually design the W and L, um, assuming that um, you have a fixed process with a known X sub J, which is a thickness, a junction thickness. Okay, so this is what a semiconductor resistor looks like in practice. You first do a diffusion to create this n-type. You put an insulator on top of it. And then you, you do a, uh, another step where you deposit metal and pattern that metal on the left and right sides in order to make electrical contacts to the semiconductor. And I'm greatly oversimplifying this because this is not a fabrication class. Like just making something like this requires many, many, many steps and a very careful process. All right. Um, so this last part here is, uh, is an example of calculating conductivity and resistance. So imagine that, uh, so in this example, you're gonna calculate the conductivity um, of silicon first, um, assuming that it's doped with 10 to the 17th phosphorus atoms, and you're gonna compare it to the conductivity of intrinsic silicon. Um, and then the second part of the question is, uh, what is the resistance of a one centimeter long slab of silicon with a cross section one by one millimeter? And we'll calculate the resistance uh, of that. All right. So um, because we're short on time here, we're over time already, I'm just gonna go through this example with you and you will have a similar problem like this in your homework. So I just wanna make sure that you can do that. Okay. So. Basically, we're saying here, we have a block of semiconductor material with the dimensions that are given here. So this is one centimeter, and then this is dimensions here, uh, one millimeter. This is also one millimeter. The material here has a doping N sub D, phosphorus, it's a column five element. So ND equals 10 to the 17th per centimeter cubed. Okay, so that's our rough diagram here. Okay, and I'm just gonna go through the calculation of how to first calculate the conductivity and then um, calculating the resistance. <clears throat> it's a pretty straightforward problem actually. The first thing that we do is that we figure out the mobility. Now this is doped with 10 to the 17th phosphorus atom. So it's N type, it's N type. Conductivity is equal to Q mu N times N plus Q mu P times P. In an N-type semiconductor, this, um, the first term, N, the, the N is uh, much greater than the second term, P. All right, so this term actually becomes insignificant in an N-type semiconductor. So we're trying to just figure out Q, mu N, and N. All right, so we're gonna figure out the mobility. We have to look up the mobility in the chart. So 10 to the 17th. So we look up here on the chart, okay. Okay, so here is the mobility. And if we just draw a line here like this. So, um, you know, we, we have to approximate here, but, you know, as, as I said before, this is 100, this is 200, 400, 600, 800, and then about 1,000 here. So we're just going to say that the mobility is equal to uh, 1,000 centimeters squared per volt second. So this is going to be Q, which is um, 
sorry, let's just do Q is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19. Mobility is 1000 centimeter squared per volt second. This is Coulomb's by the way. And then the uh, electron concentration is just 10 to the 17th. It's the same as the doping concentration. All right. So rather than um, write, write all this out, I'm just going to show you the solution on the second slide here because I've already written it out. So we found out that the electron mobility was 1,000. We looked that up on the chart. We don't need to find out find the whole mobility. It's not significant in this problem. So the um, the conductivity, we you know, as I said, we tossed this term out. Um, Q is 1.6 times 10 to the negative 19 coulombs. Mobility is 1,000. N is 10 to the 17th. Okay, so that gives us a conductivity of 16 ohm centimeters to the negative one. And then once we have this conductivity, figuring out the resistance is pretty straightforward. Like the problem we did earlier today, R is equal to L divided by sigma A. Uh, we've already, we figured out what the sigma was. It's 16 ohm centimeters. So that's what comes here. So that's our sigma. The cross-sectional area is 0.1 centimeters by 0.1 centimeters. Now keep in mind that the, the question was saying that it's one by one millimeter. So we have to convert all the units into centimeters. Okay. Now this is the part that sometimes confuses students. Students think, well, why do we use meters sometimes and centimeters at other times? I'm sorry. Uh, it's just <laughs> in modules two where we're doing a lot of the quantum mechanics. Um, that is the, the meters is the preferred length unit there. And in this um, in this module in this module, when we start working with semiconductor devices in silicon in particular, uh, the centimeters has emerged as the popular unit to use. So uh, it's just something you have to live with. So 0 0.1 centimeters times 0 0.1 centimeters, the width times the height, and then the length on the top here is one centimeters. And this comes out to 6.25 ohms. Okay, fairly straightforward problem that you should be able to figure out. Uh, one other quick thing here, velocity saturation at high electric fields. You know, thus far, we have uh, talked about the velocity of the electrons being a linear function of the electric field. So our drift velocity model that we talked about is the, the velocity is equal to the mobility times the electric field. Right. So, but it, it turns out, you know, that this basic drift velocity model, it doesn't hold at high electric fields. What actually happens is that the electric field looks like the velocity looks like this. Okay. It looks like the green line. And it's described by this equation here. The velocity saturation model describes this as, um, the velocity is equal to mu e divided by one plus mu e over v saturation. Okay, you can remember this equation. It'll probably also be given to you in a formula sheet, but basically it starts off linear like this and then it kind of curves and flattens out um, to, uh, to a quantity called the saturation velocity. And this velocity saturation happens due to something called optical phonon generation uh, that we won't be going into in detail. But I do want you to know that um, that these uh, that this effect exists, and if you end up studying high-speed electronics, you'll definitely run into this. Uh, for the different materials, silicon, germanium, gallium arsenide, indium phosphide, you could this graph shows the velocity of the electrons and holes as a function of the electric field. So what you see here is that at low electric fields. Uh, the, the, the velocities are, they go up, they're linear, they're proportional to the electric field. So velocity is equal to mu times the electric field like we talked about before. But once you get to a certain saturation velocity, then uh, the velocity things change. It flattens out in some cases. And in some, some what's called multi-valley materials like gallium arsenide, you can have even have this weird effect where the mobility peaks at a certain electric field and then it goes down like this. Okay, we're not going to go into the details of uh, why that is, um, but just know that it's there. 
Uh, for silicon, you can remember these two, um, write them down in your notes. The saturation velocity for electrons is one times 10 to the seven centimeters per second. For holes is 0.6 times 10 to the seventh. Okay. We won't be doing too much of this in this class, to be honest with you. Just know that it exists because when, when you start talking about high speed electronics, you, th this velocity saturation equation definitely comes into play. I just want to prepare you for that. All right, uh, last thing real quick, and then we'll end here, is the energy band model for drift current. Uh, so suppose we have a voltage that's placed across an n-type semiconductor. If we don't apply a voltage, interestingly, we've drawn our energy band diagrams like this thus far. Conduction band, valence band, OK? So I told you that an important part of the energy band diagram is what happens is that this is energy. The y-axis is energy, but the x-axis is position. All right. Now, the reason why this becomes important, the reason why we use energy band diagrams is actually because this, it turns out this position part is very um, useful. So if we have a block of semiconductor material like we've drawn before, we understand the physical model now. We understand the, um, the electrons and holes moving through the material, bumping into things. That's kind of the physical model. Now we want to look at the energy band model for drift current. So basically, we're, we're going to do an example where the voltage is higher on this side and lower on this side. What happens in the energy band diagram is when you apply a voltage then the um, uh, it actually causes a slope in the energy band diagram. Okay, and what I would like you to do for the time being, I want you to just take this at face value and assume that this is true. We're going to talk more about this in detail later. When a positive voltage is placed across the semiconductor, the Fermi level on the negative side is higher by convention. This is the part I just want you to just take at face value for now. So the right side of the diagram is at the negative potential. The energy band, the Fermi level on this side is going to be high. And the Fermi level on the positive side is going to be low. OK. So when the Fermi level tilts like this, OK, the original diagram looked like this. This is an n-type semiconductor. And the Fermi level was like this. By placing a voltage across it, we basically tilted the Fermi level. And it turns out when we tilt the Fermi level, the conduction and valence bands have to tilt as well. Because remember the distance between EC and EF, between EF and EV, all these distances are fixed by the, by the doping. Right? We're not changing the doping from left to right side. We're, the, the carrier concentrations are staying the same. We're only applying a voltage. So the, applying the voltage, it tilts the Fermi level and these other bands tilt alongside with it. So the way that you can think about um, drift current is that electrons that are up in the conduction band, remember there are a bunch of energy states up in the conduction band, like this. So the electron sees energy states, and then next to it, it sees another energy state. So it just hops from energy state to energy state. So it's, it goes to increasingly lower energy states, and that's how it's moving from right to left. So in the physical model, we say that the electron is moving opposite the electric field. And in the energy band model, we can say that the electron is actually just hopping and hopping adjacent, hopping to adjacent energy states that are slightly lower energy. And that's how it moves across the material. Okay. When the electrons are moving from right to left, the current is moving from left to right. Because remember, current is the movement of positive charge. So whichever direction the electron moves, the current is going in the opposite direction. In a p-type semiconductor, you can think about holes being in the valence band. And the holes move upwards, where the electrons move downwards. The reason why is because you think about, um, suppose you have an electron here. <laughs> 
the electron sees an empty state, it moves down like this. And so the hole shifts up like that. So the holes move up the slope, electrons move down the slope. And that's a key thing to remember. All right, so uh, we'll talk more about like these holes and electrons moving in the energy bands as we get to the diode chapter. But I just wanna introduce the concept of drift in an N-type and P-type semiconductor now so that it makes more sense later. Okay. Um, the last thing, I think I'm just gonna skip over this for now, just in the interest of time, because we're already way over. And I really appreciate everybody staying, um, staying extra today. Um, it's important that we just, we don't fall too behind in the, in the class. So I uh, suggest that you can kind of do this on your own, the conductivity of undoped silicon. You can figure out, um, you can write out your own equations for it. Um, or you already have the equations, you can just solve for it. These are just practice questions. You'll have more practice questions on the uh, on the homeworks as well. Okay, so we are skipping over the E versus K stuff, and we will just sum up here. So what we found in module three is that in solid materials, you have these hybridizations that happen. So you have hybrid orbitals that result in energy bands. Uh, so we have, um, we talked about electrical current uh, that requires carriers and empty states. Uh, we talked about the carrier statistics, which helps us figure out whether an, um, an, an state is occupied or not. We talked about the density of states. We said that it increases above EC and below EV. Um, and we talked about the Fermi level, which is it's in between EC and EV and intrinsic material. It moves up higher as you dope at N type, it moves down as you dope at P type. We figured out uh, equations for carrier concentrations. We found that it depends on temperature and doping. And then in today's class, we talked about mobility. Um, the, you know, the mobility depends on how much scattering there is. There's two scattering mechanisms, lattice and impurity scattering. And it's also, you know, and those mechanisms are dependent on temperature and the carrier's effective mass. So there's a lot of concepts we talked about. Eventually we got to a more practical application where we calculated the conductivity of the material. If we know the doping, at this point, if you know the doping of a material, you should be able to draw the energy band diagram, calculate the conductivity. And if I give you a geometry, you should be able to calculate the resistance of that geometry. This last point here about electrons having energy and momentum, we will come back to that later in this term if we, if we have time. Just wanna cover the main concepts here, okay? Um, Again, thanks everyone for staying extra. I know we went, we went quite a bit over today. Uh, I just wanted to finish up this module today. Um, thanks for your attention. So if you have any questions on the homework, let me know. Um, I'll be available uh, just by email. Um, we can also meet in office hours if you'd like. All right, thanks, thanks. everyone. Yep, so I'll see, you every, uh, see you everybody on Monday. Thank you, Professor. Have a great weekend. You too, bye-bye.